Uh, this Hangout on air is live. I guess so we're working. All right. It looks like, uh, apologize for any delay, a couple minutes delay. Uh, this is our first time we've done this. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's just, um, I guess there's like a group chat on the side. If you guys have any questions or anything like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the business of CrossFit. If you just want to chat it up for a second, let's make it happen. I don't know. Is this thing not working? There's a few bugs, glitches here, but is it not working? Make this. Which one's small? Daniel, show up over here. Oh, there we go. I'm considering opening an affiliate, but I'm wondering... Which one's just I'm considering opening... Okay, Do you show up over here? Boom, there we go. I'm trying to open my first box, but finding the right location within our budget is rough. My question is, should I make an effort and invest in a more expensive location or not? Uh, Dave, that's a good question. It depends on where you're at. Um... Just saw Ty's question. Thanks. Oh, so, there we go. There's a huge I'm delay. considering opening an affiliate, but I'm... Jason is swagging. So in regards to opening an affiliate, I think there's a couple things to think about. Um, number one is, yeah, is location important? It is and it isn't, right? Uh, unlike a conventional gym where uh, you know you want that exposure in a retail location. When you're at a CrossFit gym, it's more about the service you're offering. Given that, there's a lot of rules that apply. So for those of you who have looked into locations, you may have found that opening a CrossFit affiliate is not as easy as you think in terms of finding the proper zoning. So here's the catch-22. You go into warehouse space. Warehouse space is very uh, beneficial for a CrossFit gym because it's open ceilings, it's open floor plan, it generally is not next to any buildings you really care about making any noise. The downside is that the city probably won't approve your use. So you might have to go to the city and get a conditional use permit um, or do other types of things because you're going to be an assembly use. Whereas in a retail location, you don't have to worry about zoning with the city. Is this working? Okay. So... My recommendation is when you're first looking for your first box, I've done a couple things in the past. One thing I did is I once signed a lease, a lease, and it had a uh, an addendum to it or, or an additional component that my lawyer drew up where if a governmental agency came in to shut down our business, uh, we had the right to get out of that lease. What you don't want to see happen is go into a 5,000 square foot facility, right? You're in a warehouse space, you're paying, let's just say, I don't know, five, 10 grand a month, and you're on a five year lease. All of a sudden, um, an agency comes in and tells you that uh, you can no longer do business there. So now you're on the hook for five years of, you know, 10,000 bucks a month. And so you need to be able to get out of that. So just something to think about is that when you do go get a new location, you wanna make sure your zoning is right. Um, yeah, so here's a couple things to think about. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, Jesus. There's a lot of comments coming in. Um, yeah, so let's talk about, uh, let's, just, let's just talk for a moment about facilities. So what's, a, what's a good size? What have I found? So NorCal CrossFit currently owns or operates 
about 20 locations worldwide, and that includes corporate sites and whatnot. Given that, we have some locations that are as small as uh, 4,000 square feet, and we have as large as, uh, I think the one I'm in right now is 35,000 square feet. Very large. Um, too large, actually. What I've found, and in, in the secret that I believe is a, is a future model for at least NorCal CrossFit and maybe some other affiliates, is I think 5,000 square feet is the ideal space to move into. Now, I wouldn't say that right off the start. A lot of people, because of the popularity of CrossFit, they want to go in and get these large spaces that are you know, glamorous and whatnot. The downside is that there's a lot of expense involved with that. So what you're hearing is you're hearing affiliate owners um, you know, taking out loans, getting partners, doing all types of things to create this badass location off the start instead of taking their time starting small and then working their way up. Now the reason why I like 5,000 square feet, okay, and I know none of our locations are actually that, but the reason why I like 5,000 square feet, five to eight, is because it allows you to keep the quality of your coaching um, and keep your community strong. Whereas when you have a space that's 20, 30, 40,000 square feet, it starts to get a little bit too crowded, a little bit too busy. And so I'd recommend to kind of look at that 5,000 square foot um, space range so you can keep the community tight. And then what you do over time, if you want to increase profitability, increase whatever, is you open up locations about 15 to 20 minutes apart from each other, each being about 5,000 square feet. What's the most important equipment to invest on for starting an affiliate? That's a very good question. So I've traveled the world um, being a part of CrossFit HQ uh, on their seminar staff, and I've had the opportunity to see a lot of gyms. And oftentimes I could tell the signs of a good gym is if they have a lot of bumper plates, barbells, dumbbells, and a nice rig. Things like rowers and GHDs, yeah, they look glamorous, they look nice. The downside with them is they don't give you the biggest bang for your buck. So let's talk equipment just for a second because I think this is a really important thing that I want to get across to you guys. When I go to a, you know, some affiliates, you're asking the question, how do you, you know, if you open up a gym, your goal is to generate revenue. It's to uh, support your family and the family of your, of your coworkers. Um, if you fill that by spending $20,000 on rowers to get 20 rowers, you're not really getting your biggest bang for your buck. Instead, spend half of that on dumbbells, kettlebells, barbells, and bumper plates, which are going to be able to service a whole lot more members. Lowell's asking a question, would it be wise to open a CrossFit gym starting off as an investor owner while hiring an experienced CrossFit coach, someone else does the coaching while I focus on growing the business. Well, let's talk about that. There's definitely a couple pros and cons to that. Um, let's talk about the pros. The pros are is that you know, you're an investor, you're hiring someone else, you could probably still have your normal day job. Uh, here's the downsides. Let's take for example that I hire I don't know, Joe. I hired Joe to come and run my gym. If I hire Joe to run my gym, all the members think of Joe as the owner. All the members are connected to Joe. All the members love Joe. They don't even know who I am. All I am is just an absentee investor. So what happens if, I don't know, 30, you know, 30 days or you know, three years down the line, this guy Joe decides to open up his own gym down the street? Well now, you're no longer connected to your members. And so where are those members going to go? Those members are going to follow Joe because they love Joe. They don't love the investor behind it. Lowell, did that answer your question at all? Ha. 
How much money can you make off a gym? Uh, you can make a lot of money off a gym, or you can make a little money off a gym. It really just depends. I mean, one thing I would say is just do the math, right? If you have 100 members and they're paying $200 a month, that's $20,000 a month. However, you got to look at your overhead and expenses. The largest expenses that we have here at NorCal CrossFit and most CrossFit affiliates are going to be two things. Um, basically, it's going to be your rent expense and it's going to be your payroll expense. And in our particular case, our payroll expense is significantly more than any of our other expenses. Yeah, we have insurance. Yeah, we have you know this, that, and other stuff, electricity, whatever. But the bottom line is payroll is going to be your most expensive uh, uh, item. Here's, so Stanley's asking, so with you, with your separate locations, are they owners or just hired coaches? That's a good question. They are going to be um, operators, what we call them. And with the operators, what we do is we basically set up a relationship with them where there's incentive programs, they get a you know nice salary, comfortable salary, and the idea is for them to run the place like they own it. Now, we set up those affiliates, though, but it's not separate ownership. We kept it all under one umbrella. And we did that so that members can go back and forth between all the different locations, and we didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, th those issues there. And so I own all of them, but we created profit share programs and um, good salaries for the people who manage them. Joe Jensen, Joe asked, what are your thoughts on uh, opening a box just down the street from another box. And in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, however, out of respect for them, um, I, would, I would probably go talk with them. And if you're a good business owner, if you're a good gym affiliate owner, there's nothing wrong with that. And the reason for it is the more gyms you could have in a particular area, the more people are going to talk about CrossFit. And the more people are talking about CrossFit, the better it is for everybody in that ecosystem. And so, you know, here we are in San Jose, California. There's tons of affiliates here, but that's pro that's not a problem for us. The more affiliates, the better. And the reason for it is you don't need that many members to become profitable. You just need to have a good program. And so I'm not worried about having someone open them down the street. I actually encourage it because then they're going to do promotions. They're going to do stuff. Those friends are going to tell their friends, and then boom, all of a sudden we might get more members. The more people shopping for CrossFit, the better. The question is asked, what is the best marketing strategy for a new box? And my answer is, offer really good quality coaching. I think sometimes people get too wrapped up in, oh, I want to do this flyer or this or that. And that kind of stuff we don't need. What you need to do is offer high quality coaching and uh, put someone in a position where if you're the affiliate manager, owner, or operator, whoever, um, they greet everybody, they know everybody, you hold community events. That's going to be your best way. You know, in the beginning, it's the hardest part is getting 10, 15 people through your door. Once you get that, they're going to tell more and more and more friends. Um, I saw a question, you know, how do you convince someone to try CrossFit compared to other, you know, other stuff? I think the answer is you got to get them in the door. Um, that was also another question I just saw about, uh, you know, corporate stuff, right? Someone says, hey, how do you start a corporate account? I get that all the time. And really what it is, is, is you start off with your members in the gym, okay? So, you know, you build value in what you have to offer. Hey, we're NorCal CrossFit. Hey, I'm CrossFit XYZ. We're the best cross around here because of this, 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 this. Build your value in what you're doing. And then what they're going to do is they're going to come to you and say, hey, you know, I work at this company, I'm the president, I'm the CFO, whatever. And then you develop that relationship where you go on site there and you just give it away for free. You go ahead and offer a 6 a.m. class, you show value in what you're offering, and in the long term, they're going to want to bring that on. But if you first start talking about money, uh, it's going to turn people off. You want to sh first show value in what you have to offer, and then later on try and create, uh, you know, long-lasting contracts, relationships. Quality coaches turn into members, member retention. I completely agree, Kyle. 
Um, the question is, memberships are pretty expensive for a CrossFit gym. From my understanding, does that turn a lot of people off? Um, NorCal CrossFit started off charging $150 a month for everybody and then $100 for military and law enforcement. We now charge $220 a month for everybody and uh, $167 for military and law enforcement. And what I say to that is, yes, is CrossFit more expensive? Absolutely, but I believe we deserve that because we're going to offer high-quality coaching. And so I think the answer is, you know, is CrossFit expensive? Yes. However, it needs to be worth its value. Is a Rolls-Royce expensive? Is a, you know, uh, BMW expensive? Yes, but people pay for them because they see value in that um, product because of how good it is. Yeah, so one of the questions here is, can you talk more about starting up your first box and any struggles financially you had to overcome? I would love to quit my day job, but it's hard to let go of um, a salary benefits 401k. Completely agree. You know, you find that a lot with, with certain people. They get into CrossFit, they're super passionate about it, they're excited about it, and um, they want to pursue it as a career. However, they have bills, they have families, and how are they just going to leave all that secure, um, you know, finances to go ahead and take a leap of good faith into a CrossFit affiliate. And what I would say is this, there's 10,000 CrossFit affiliates in the world right now. I've been in a lot of them, obviously not all of them. And a lot of them are successful. And the reason why they're successful is because they're started with owners who care. Now, the fine line is there's really good coaches and there's really good businessmen, but you rarely find um, good businessmen who are also good coaches. That's pretty rare. And so what I would do is if you wanted to start up a company, I would find really good quality coaches and um, develop their skills. I would develop your own skills as a, as a, as a you know, the affiliate owner and I'd be there day and night creating value for your members. And as far as financial situations, yeah, the biggest problem is nowadays because CrossFit has a lot of popularity, people want to go out and get these badass locations and spend a bunch of money. But that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to start small, start lean, and then work your way up. My first lease was six months long, and it was 1500 bucks a month. And I told myself that I needed to get the hell out of that place in six months, and so it put me on my grind. But all of a sudden, if I go get funding and I raise $500,000, I'm not going to have that same mentality, that same grind. So if you have a job, you have a 401k, and you want to know what it's going to take to be successful, in my opinion, you start lean and you work your way up. But what's challenging for a lot of people is they have one foot in and one foot out. You really can't do that. Um, you, know, you can start an affiliate with a bunch of partners and maybe try that way, but if you want that to eventually become your sole income and your sole business, you probably need to take a leap of faith and really invest all your time into it. Otherwise, you end up doing two things 50% instead of one thing 100%. Sam, thanks for your feedback, man. I appreciate that. Pre-made packages of equipment, it's good. Um, but in my opinion, like I said before, it's not about... Uh, you know, in my opinion, rowers, GHDs, uh, reverse hypers, things like that, they're just luxury items. What you really need is the, is the nuts and bolts. You need the kettlebells, the dumbbells, the barbells, the bumper plates. Get that and then go from there. Um, find rubber flooring. Um, if I was you, I'd look for stall mats. Get them on Craigslist or whatever. But keep it cheap, keep it lean, but make it look good. How do you go from free classes to paid classes then? Good question, CrossFit uh, Macomb. Uh, okay, so first and foremost, you find um, connections in your community, right? So you first, if you ever want to get corporate accounts, you got to first have a normal retail account. So you, you create relationships with these people. They know who you are. They know what's going on. They introduce you to your HR. You go from there. You say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a three-month pilot program. And... I'm going to come in, I'm going to do two classes a week at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., whatever it may be, and, you know, we're just going to bring dumbbells there, and we're going to keep it super, super simple. After that three-month pilot program, so you set the standard, you're going to say, okay, it's going to be a three-month pilot program, or two-month, or whatever you want to do, whatever you could get away for free. Then, after that, you say, okay, after that pilot program, um, we're going to go ahead and renegotiate, and uh, here's some, you know, basically, after you've already created value, then you sit them down and you talk about moving forward and uh, you give an idea. And there's comes of different options when it comes to corporate stuff. You can go ahead and just have on-site stuff where you can go there, bring equipment, do some classes and get paid an hourly wage, you know, 100, 200 bucks an hour, whatever. 
from there, it really just depends on how large the company is. If it's 100 employees or 200 employees, they're probably not going to put an on-site CrossFit on. But if it's 500, 1,000 employees, an on-site CrossFit is going to be where your money is being made at and where they're going to see a ton of value. And the reason why they're going to see a ton of value is because their employees are going to start going there. They're going to network. They're going to, they're going to have more energy. It's going to be excellent. The long-term goal, at least for my company, is um, create corporate relationships where we can have full CrossFit affiliates on-site because I believe they're a great way to develop a sense of community, not only outside the gym, or not only outside the company, but inside the company. How do you increase the prices is the question. Um, we did not increase previous members. So if you're already a member of the gym, you, we were not going to increase your price. So if you were a member here of NorCal CrossFit seven, eight years ago, we have never increased your prices. You're grandfathered in. However, after that, um, when new people enroll, we just change the pricing on the website. And we set a date. We say, okay, on June 1st, we're going to increase this, 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 this. And we let, our, um, we, let, we let people know on our website so that they're aware of it. So if they want to enroll at a lesser price, they need to enroll before X date. Otherwise, it's going to bump up a little bit. Yeah, so Dean's asking a question I'd already brought up a little bit ago, but I'll just say it again. Um, yeah, permitting industrial space, absolutely. So I've moved into, oh, by now, I don't know, 10 look. You know, we have 15 corporate sites with HCST, Hitachi Global Storage Technology. We do other corporate stuff, but um, through our normal locations, we've probably moved, I don't know, 10 times. And the biggest problem we have is with zoning and uh, industrial space. And so really, at, at your time, you need to make one of two choices. Option A, you move into an industrial space and you take an op a risk. You take the risk that the city may come in and shut you down, but the industrial space is great for what we do. And um, it's great for what we do because the rents are cheap, the ceilings are high, the noise is low, etc. Um, but if you want to do it right, you're going to probably have to go into retail space because of the, the zoning. And the downside of that is you're going to be paying a lot more per square foot. And so you need to do the math and decide, is it worth it for me to go in a you know downtown retail location at five bucks a square foot or whatever compared to paying a, a you know warehouse price of a dollar a square foot and that's gonna be something you're gonna have to think about more. Um, the couple of ideas I had was you know a try and have a lawyer drop something where you you um, have an agreement with your landlord that if a government agency does come in you could potentially get out if someone does try and shut you down. You have subleasing options right. You got to make sure that happens because the last thing you want is to be on a three or five year lease be on the hook for that. And, um, and get kicked out. Second to that, really try not to personally guarantee any lease. Um, you're going to want to try and get that lease underneath the company. So if people want you to personally guarantee it, I'd try and avoid that at all costs. I'd set up an LLC or an S Corp or C Corp, whatever you want to do. you got to talk to your lawyers. And I'd have all your locations or your location underneath that, um, uh, underneath that corporation. I wouldn't personally guarantee anything. This way, just in case you were on a long-term lease and something did happen, you're not personally on the hook. Sean's asking, we have one location that's been very successful for five years. Would you suggest a possible business loan to open a second affiliate and uh, pay operators a good salary? Good question. First thing I'd ask you is, do you have the personnel to open up a second location? The first thing that I always ask myself is, why are we opening up a second location? And the reason why we open up new locations at NorCal CrossFit is not because we want to expand and grow. The reason why we open up second, third, fourth locations is because we have key employees who need to progress in their um, professional career, and we don't have opportunities currently for them. And so if we didn't offer them a new opportunity with us, they would go somewhere else and open up their own gym. I'd rather open one with them because they're excellent. So the first question I ask yourself is, do you have the personnel to support a new location? If the answer is yes, then you got to determine if you want a loan or not. If the interest rates are low, it's not a bad idea. But in my opinion, I hate having any debt. So I've, our company's debt free. So I would try and do it that way. If you can't afford it, I wouldn't pay for it. NorCal CrossFit is probably five times more expensive than a normal gym membership around here. I've been doing CrossFit for nine years. Whew. 
If you had to recommend the amount of reserves needed when opening the gym, what would that be? Did it just shut off? Oh, it's back. It's back. What's up, Chris? If you had to recommend the amount of reserves needed when opening up a gym, um, what would that be? I would say, yeah, six months of operating expenses would be good at least. Um, I didn't do that. I opened up my first gym with about 5000 bucks, and uh, that was enough for operating for a month or two. And so I didn't pay myself a salary. I didn't do anything, and my rent was 1500 bucks. So I didn't leave myself another option but to be successful because I had to grind it out. Now, I do believe that you should have six months. Like our goal at NorCal CrossFit is we always want in the bank six months of payroll, six months of operating expenses because you never know uh, what's going to happen. Is there a source to find uh, cross locations for sale? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, some of these are... How can a CrossFit coach make more money with any box as an entrepreneur? Omar, um, if you're a coach inside a, of a gym right now, you got to think about, about it as an owner. So here I am, the owner of this gym, and when we have employees, what they need to think about is, if I was the owner of this facility, what would I do um, differently? So you, it's the way you act, right? So a lot of people say they want to own gyms, they want to be an entrepreneur. But then when you watch the way they act, the way they do things, they're never going to be an entrepreneur. They're never going to own anything because they don't act like it today. So what makes you think that tomorrow when you do get a gym, you're going to suddenly switch gears and, and change? You need to start acting like an owner today. And what that means is you walk through the bathroom, it's dirty, clean that shit up. You, you, know, you see a member that's struggling, you talk to him. You don't just do your job to do your job. You do your job acting like you own the place because then one day you will own the place. Now, if I was a a coach inside of a gym, I would try and find revenue streams that made money for the affiliate, but I could also pull some money from as well. So a good example of that would be, I don't know, uh, you know, offering one day seminars that, you know, are 10 bucks or whatever, and you get half of it, the owner gets half of it. Well, the owner's not going to complain if you're adding value for his members and you're making a couple extra bucks because he's making a couple extra bucks. That's a good way to think about it is a lot of times people always want more money. They always want more money, but the owner needs to think about, you know, what is this doing for the business? And so you need to try and convince him, this is good for the business because X, Y, Z. It's adding value for our members. It's giving back to our community. It's, it's charity. It's whatever. Um, that's something to think about. How important, um, Brian, great question. How important would you say coaching in a box experience is prior to opening a, um, co prior to opening a box? I have a degree in physical education. I've experienced training students, athletes, using CrossFit met methodology. I would say that training at a uh, uh, coaching at a box is extremely important. You can't expect to open up a business if you don't know the ins and outs of that business. Before I opened up my CrossFit affiliate, I worked all throughout high school and college at a conventional gym where I learned how to sell memberships. I learned how to run a business. And so then I worked at a CrossFit affiliate for a year before I opened up my first gym. And I learned the ins and outs of it. How do you go from just, um, you need practical application. You know, I had a lot of professors in college, right? And they read a lot of books, but they didn't know shit when it came to practical application. I've learned so much more through opening up all these businesses than I ever did in college because you get that practical application. So I would highly recommend coach an affiliate, understand what it means to cater to different types of people and then open up your gym. You know, the question comes up again, how do you recommend getting your starting money? And honestly, um, I, I, I don't think you need to cr get starting money. I think if you have to go out searching for starting money, then you're probably trying to start off too big. Start lean. Start in your garage. Build value with 5, 10, 15 clients. 
get some people behind you that could tell their friends and tell their friends. You don't need to start big. You just need to um, start smooth, offer high quality coaching, and move from there. Dale's asking, you know, you keep stressing how much quality coaching is important. Fuck yeah. Absolutely. If you, if you ask me one single thing that can grow your business, it's good quality coaching and people who actually give a shit about your members. Number one. Number one, number one, number one. What do we do? Well, first off, you got to have a cross for level one. Then you got to go for your level two. You got to go to coach's prep course. You got to get all the different seminars that CrossFit HQ puts out. They're great. They're 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 top notch. Um, in addition to that, you then need to hold your trainers and yourself accountable for continuous, continually learning. So, like at our gym, for example, you know we have 60 employees here. Uh, Pat Barber, um, he's cross the level one uh, staff, like I, I have been for years. We have a lot of cross stage Q trainers here, and we have constant um, trainer development courses here. And we don't want to get complacent with the coaching because the members can sense that. If you just keep doing the same shit over and over again, they're going to sense it. you got to educate yourself. Go see Carl Pioli. Go see Kelly Starrett. Go see powerlifters. Go see different people and learn and learn and learn so you can bring that knowledge back to them. Rowdy, do I even lift? Yes, I lift. <laughs> do you see your children more than, more than doing CrossFit? It's a good question, Jill. Uh, because I... Uh, you know, compete at the highest level in CrossFit. I own, you know, 20 locations, and uh, I have a family. It's challenging, but I spend a lot of my time training in the garage, and I just try and delegate my time appropriately. So I do not see my children more than I do CrossFit. I work a lot more, um, but um, I'm developing something for the future for them, and uh, you know, just put in the work now. Outside of word of mouth, what are your best way to attract members? That's it, man. I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's the number one. We've tried Yelp deals. We've tried Google deals. But really all you're doing is you're devaluing your product. You're getting a huge influx of people who don't really see value in what you're offering. Instead, stay true to your roots. Offer good quality coaching. Hold community events. And I believe your business will grow steadily. If a box is open from 6 to um, 1, and from uh, two to you know, min whatever. How many coaches you recommend to have? It really depends on the class size, right? So if the class size is ten or less, you know, you definitely get away with one coach. If it's more than that, you might need two, and it depends on the ability um, of uh, those coaches. So for example, I've been doing this long enough. That if you give me a class of twenty, I'm more than comfortable with it, and I can adequately coach them. But if uh, you know, if you gave a new coach a class of twenty, they could freak out. And so you need to assess how good is that coach, number one, and then uh, uh, number two, how many people are in the class. That's really what's going to tell you. I think a good class to coach ratio is, you know, 15 at the most, I think is good. Thiza asked, um, do you have pro shop at your locations? The answer is yes. Um, here's the pro shop. Right behind me, here's one pro shop. I don't know if you guys can see that big ass flag back there. So the answer is yes, we do have a pro shop. Um, we see success, but at the same time, you need to make sure that you delegate the retail out. You need to make sure that um, whoever is running it is keeping good track of money in, money out, uh, shipping properly, and you need to actually really do an assessment. Like, hey. Here I am. I'm selling Fit Aid. I get Fit Aid for uh, you know, I get Fit Aid for I don't know a buck. I'm selling it for a buck fifty. Uh, you know, is fifty cents really worth my time? Because you have to have someone manage that, right? So now you're paying someone an hourly wage to manage that. And then what if one Fit Aid or 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 other drink? It doesn't have to be Fit Aid. Walks off the shelf. How many more do you need to sell to recoup that cost? Just something to think about. Last time you ate McDonald's or drank a beer, uh, last night I had a, a martini. Uh, I drank a beer probably two days before at a wedding. So, yeah, I'm, I'm down with that. 
McDonald's, long time. Have you done anything in terms of developing other programs within your gyms to hedge yourself against the possible demise and the opportunity of CrossFit, popularity of CrossFit, if the bubble bursts? Great question, Sean. Uh, the answer is yes. Really for us, it's getting to the corporate market. And we diversify in several different ways. Right now, we're looking at you know hotels. We're looking at uh, we're looking at uh, businesses, and, and we're looking at our normal CrossFit locations. The bottom line is that CrossFit gets great results. So whether it's called CrossFit or just functional strength conditioning or whatever it may turn to in the future, I don't know. But I think CrossFit will be around for a long time because people are getting incredible results and they love the community. And what I think is the is going to be a challenge for a lot of CrossFit affiliates is being in that middle range. I think there's going to be some uh, Globo gyms that come out and offer CrossFit at a discounted rate. And because of that, CrossFit gyms need to be fully aware of that. What if a 24-hour fitness down the street offers CrossFit at 50 bucks a month or less? Well, people are going to be more inclined potentially to go over there unless your quality is 10 times better because 24-hour fitness has a nicer facility, blah, blah. So really what I think in the future of CrossFit is you're not really going to see these middle-of-the-road affiliates. You're going to see either you know um, less expensive affiliates or more expensive. So NorCal CrossFit's goal in the future is to become like the Nordstrom's of CrossFit or Neiman Marcus, whatever you want to call it, where we charge a little bit more, but we offer the service that is capable of charging that. Because then if a 24-hour fitness opens up nearby, it's not a big deal because it's a different clientele. Is it smart to let the owner of the box you go to know you're looking to open up your own gym? And what are your thoughts on having that owner as a partner of the gym? I plan on opening. I think, yeah, I think talking to him is, is something out of respect, letting him know. Um, letting him know there's a good way to do business and a bad way to do business. I've seen it go both ways. I think that if you're in the gym, you're learning from them. I think if they know that you have goals and aspirations of opening a gym, you can at least offer the opportunity of them getting involved. If they don't want to, no problem. Um, in regards to partnerships, they could be great or they could be terrible. I would just say this one point on partnerships. Make sure going into it, it's extremely, extremely clear on the roles, expectations, and, and what would happen if you need to dissolve that relationship. It needs to be clearly stated, lawyer written up. None of this like, oh, we have five partners. We just kind of like did it over a couple of beers. No, it should be lawyer written up. What are roles and expectations? What are they getting paid for those roles and expectations? And what happens if they're not executing on those? And if you guys do need to dissolve that relationship, what happens to the business? Jason, if you were hiring a coach, how would you assess their quality? First things first, I'd sit down with them, have a meal, get to know who they are. If they're good people, if they're, um, if they're ethical, good people, I'm all about it, right? And from there, I could develop them. Uh, the, the downside is that if they're not ethical, good people, I can't develop that much. So first things first, are they good people, are they passionate? And then from there, you've got to be able to develop them. And you have to be confident enough in yourself to uh, – to be able to develop them. And I'm confident that our gyms, we have the staff to do that. What degree is needed to become a coach or owner of a CrossFit gym? Um, pretty much just a CrossFit level one certification or, or a seminar you need to go through. And you know, CrossFit really allows you to kind of take it on your own and make it happen. And that's what I love about it. They let you either sink or swim. They don't tell you how to do things. It's up to you. And some affiliates do great. Some affiliates don't do as well. But the bottom line is if you care about your clients and you offer good quality service, you're going to have a successful business. What are the little expenses no one thinks about in their budget of owning a CrossFit gym? Uh, workers' comp, uh, payroll taxes, uh, insurance, um, electricity, uh, you know, um, uh, sales tax if you're selling uh, T-shirts and things like that. Um, you know, workers' comp is really a big one. Uh, I would just say among that, you know, just, you know, trainer development, that kind of stuff adds up. Um, and obviously locations, finding one, what happens if something goes sour and you need to find a new one, you know, how long, what if your business has to shut down for a month or two because it, uh, you know, has a flood. You have to have all these different types of things calculated in your mind so you have some reserves left over. Have you had problems with the box being aggressive towards other box? And if so, what steps did you take to resolve this problem? 
Um, no, I haven't. I think that if you're being aggressive towards another box, you're doing something wrong. We're all in this to try and help people and to all be successful. You know, here's the thing: 24-hour fitness or you know whatever gym, LA Fitness, they need thousands and thousands of members to be profitable. A CrossFit gym only needs hundreds. There's hundreds of thousands of people that probably live in your city. There's many CrossFit affiliates that can be successful, and you all can be successful. You just need to develop um, a good relationship with each other, and if you want to be successful, offer better fucking service than other people, person, but don't hate on the other group. Just offer better service. Most important streams of revenue, memberships. Memberships, memberships, memberships. Get EFT, electronic funds transfers. Avoid cash for memberships. You want every month for those credit cards to get charged so you can see that revenue stream coming in and you can allocate accordingly moving forward. When you have cash, yeah, it's cool because you might be able to you know, save on a tax here or there or whatever. The downside is you're always chasing after people for money. It's terrible. Get a credit card or a checking account, hook it up to the account, and track their participation and, uh, and, and follow up with them if they don't show up. What software would you recommend for managing your gym? Right now we use Zen Planner. Um, it's good. Do you just do unlimited memberships? Yes. The answer is yes. I only do unlimited memberships. And the reason why I only do unlimited memberships is because um, I believe that we should never um, discourage someone from coming in more times than they want. Uh, I think this is just my personal opinion, but I believe that discounting for only coming in three days a week or four days a week is basically saying, hey, we're going to give you an incentive to come in less to our gym. Well, it's like, well, fuck, of course I'm going to go three to, you know, instead it's like, no, come in as much as you can, and in the long run, I firmly believe you're actually going to have more success because they're going to get better results. If they're only coming in two, three days a week, they're not going to get the results that you're looking for, they're not going to tell as many friends. Instead, if they come in every day, boom, uh, you're going to get better results, you're going to tell more friends, and in the long run, it's going to be a, a moneymaker for you. Uh, Leonardo, thanks, man. Thanks for coming on from Brazil. You know, other than level one, level two, going on from CrossFit, do you have any other fitness certs? We have in-house uh, fitness seminars we have going on uh, just because our, a lot of our staff is highly educated. Um, but, you know, I, I look out for any expert. You know, who do you look for? You look for someone who knows more than you in that particular subject, bottom line. If you're starting a box, what's the proper bo etiquette for pulling the clients away? Oh, man, that's a good question. I would say um, talk to the owner and sit down with them, have a beer, and let them know that you don't have any negative intentions of pulling their business away. But ultimately, if people see better service with what you're offering, it is what it is. That owner should have been doing a better job to service his clients better. What do I think about discounts for students, police, firefighters? I'm absolutely for it, specifically for uh, military law enforcement and uh, any first responders. What if Norco runs CrossFit through 24? Booyah. Oh. How about an opening party? Is it mandatory? Um, I don't think an opening party is necessarily mandatory, but I do think it's a good way to create some hype and get people excited. You want people to bring their friends you, because as soon as you get five, ten people in the door, boom, those ten people tell another couple of friends, tell another couple of friends before you know it, your business is growing. I'm serious about Garrett. Will you hook up with me? Ashley, I'll let him know. Do you have any benefits or do you pay for your own health insurance? We pay, um, yes, we have health insurance, we have dental, and we pay, we participate a lot on that, but the employees also pay in a little bit to that. Do you think there, that you are inspiring to other, oh, I hope so. All right, so we're going to let this go for another, like, Five minutes. So I'm looking at these questions. Um, yeah, I'll walk in the back. Let's see what's going on. Is it finishing up in the back? Are there consulting firms out there that specialize in opening up a CrossFit gym? The answer is no, not that I'm aware of. Um, I think a lot of it is just uh, hit and miss, do what you can. Um, I'm taking you guys down this crazy hall here at NorCal CrossFit. Have you ever had someone who pushing you through pain and was in risk of injury 
If so, what do you do? Um, I think I let them know that it's not worth getting an injury. If you get injured, then uh, you're not going to be able to work out any longer, and so avoiding injury is key. College for business. What classification does CrossFit coaches fall in work? Uh, I, I can't remember the exact classification, but it's definitely not uh, administrative, and it's definitely expensive. What are your thoughts on your coaches coaching at local CrossFit boxes? Um, I would not prefer it. Our class is just finishing up back here. I'm not sure if you guys can see that. This is a... That's the other side of the gym. So if you can tell, right? Yeah, we have some rowers. But we have a lot more barbells, bumper plates, and uh, and dumbbells uh, because you can get a lot more action done with that. So with that said, let me just look here. Oh, what's up, bro? All right, guys. So um, that's about it for this uh, edition of uh, you know chatting with the uh, Kalipa talks, I guess. And we will. Uh, we will progress, and uh, you know we'll we'll get back on another subject next week. And uh, for all of you who joined, uh, thank you very much. And I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. How do I trim this off?